Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, it's really good to see some familiar faces out here. Um, we can thank Treehouse for the discount of pizza in the back. Um, we have a wonderful guest here tonight in Noah and Dylan. Um, yeah, so when I found out that the health were coming to the Bay uh, for their show on Friday, I thought why not uh, reach out and see if they wanted to come here. Um, if you had any interest in that. And it turns out they did. Um, lucky for us, and um, not just for a talk, but also for a show. So now we've got, um, I think we're in for a good night uh, from here on out. I think the talk's going to be great when we can be up, so make sure to follow there. Um, yeah, and then a little bit more about Noah's line of work, um, for those who may not be familiar. Um, yeah, he's accomplished, uh, an accomplished fine artist coming off of a solo exhibition. Uh, Kio Pico uh, Gallery in Los Angeles. Uh, just did a couple of live sets. Taylor is in the audience here too, somewhere. Uh, live sets in New York and London for uh, the respective fashion weeks. Uh, the, the guys just signed a record deal with Atlantic. Uh, and Noah's done some other talks, and I could go on with the list here, but um, I'll kind of, I think I'll just say the rest of the words for Noah. Um, yeah, so if you guys could. Uh, Give him a warm welcome. He's, he's right here. What's up? What's going on? I'm gonna grab my popcorn. And I'm also gonna sit just because I worry about how you guys are looking at me too much if I stand in too much surface area to look at. Um, yeah, interesting. More people than I expected. I would have thought, you know, nobody can stand here. Anymore. <laughs> it, was, it was for the free pizza, right? <laughs> Makes sense. Um, so I was, uh, I was lucky enough to go to um, Numeron's lecture this morning, thanks to Zane, and uh, obviously a really brilliant and interesting man. And I was thinking about him on that stage, and it's the perfect place for him to sort of perform in the way that he does, even though he probably didn't want to be categorized as a performer, but he apparently even said that during the lecture. But in any other setting, if he was on the street in LA, if he were on this uh, like balcony or veranda, like the words he was saying wouldn't hit his heart. So I'm hoping that some of the things I'll say here are the right context <laughs> or uh, to you guys. But to, to, go, to go off of that, um, Thinking a lot about America in general and how that works in tandem with like, the photographic realm. So always keeping in mind <clears throat> the idea of photography in the modern sense, like post sort of like 1940, and sort of the rise and decline of uh, the American zeitgeist and culture. But thinking about the founding fathers and how they came to America and they didn't believe in the sovereignty of man, they believed in that men would do sort of the evil thing if they were given the chance to do so. So they created a, a set of rules to live by the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, et cetera, et cetera, for people to model their lives around and institutions, vertical integrated institutions, instead of um, tight, tight knit communities or God, it was sort of um, these institutions created by America. And it sort of worked well for a while. Of course, there's civil war and strife and this and that, like nothing's perfect, but. Um, it worked very well, sort of like micromanaging and policing the like, United States. And this all sort of collapsed during World War II. The theory is, is that Americans saw the horror of war on a mass scale, portrayed by the media in ways they'd never seen. Um, and instead of just in their communities, there was violence worldwide that they could tangibly understand. And they turned inward. And the verbiage turned from something you would expect to see was community, and then it turned inward, sort of the soul system, myopic viewpoint, and this also rose in tandem with the proliferation of the modern mechanical camera. This is when like a 35 millimeter camera sort of came into being. So we have the ability to document and prove our existence via photographic mechanical apparatus, you know, like uh, while also turning in words and thinking more and more about ourselves. So, what I think about that, um, I'm just gonna go along here and see, and see like, what you guys are thinking in terms of that. But, 
Um, we want to also, so we think about the modern history of photography, starting with uh, Prasad, sort of the, the legendary master. He was concerned with form and function of the mechanical object in terms of like framing. You're going to notice how perfect everything is. Like the, the woman on the bridge that we record, the tree, and the, the subtle pointing of the, of the boat towards her, and the, you know, everything is expertly composed and framed. It's a quote unquote perfect image. So he sort of set the standard for what perfect image uh, would look like. Um, then we have somebody shortly after, uh, the legend Willie Nagelston, who sort of pioneered color photography. And he also popularized and coined the term uh, democratized camera. And so instead of only elite, sort of magnum level master photographers utilizing the methods of photography in their everyday life, um, about that using color and taking images, or making, rather, making images of things that were mundane in the everyday, we thought that was very important. So, um, image on the right is from uh, a project he did where he just drove across the Southwest, U Southwest USA, Los Alamos, maybe some of you guys are familiar with that book, Legendary Photo, both images from his book, but just an image of a cloud, and it may seem normal to us now because how many of us have taken an image of a cloud that looked pretty to us and didn't think much of it, but when he did this uh, in the 60s, or maybe early 70s, it was, actually it was earlier than that, but um, it was revolutionary. No one would think to um, point and take an image of something, something of that nature. Uh, moving on, then we have like, we have uh, Dino, who's a Moriyama legend, another legend, uh, black and white Japanese photographer, who is more concerned with mechanical intervention uh, when an image is created. So like compared to the last slide. Tonality, perfect. Colors, et cetera, like colors, et cetera. Very well composed frame, you know, well uh, well formed in the lab, all the chemical processes are correct. Then we have this image which is, you know, sort of eerie and scary almost, and that's mostly due to the processing, I would say, and obviously the the the, the look on the child's face helps, but you know, it's the processing he did in the lab and the technical surrogate and the apparatus he used and the way he approached that um, was sort of like his, one of his main practices. Um, and then we sort of forward fast forward to Philip Orkin of Portia, who took these principles and encapsulated them into the modern idea of what we have of a sort of professional photographer now composition, we have some griminess, we have the aestheticism, we have like sort of uh, 30 years of image making wrapped up in, into one style of photography. And now we're sort of at present day, um, I'm, I'm obviously in the same tummy gap, but just trying to speed it along here. We have, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Jurgen Teller W Magazine story that was in 2020, that sort of went viral on the internet and everyone freaked out. And, um, I would say most people thought it was a travesty and how can you do this to be a celebrity because this was um, W Magazine's, I forget what they called it, but it's sort of praising the performance of the year. So they really want them to look their best, etc. But W Magazine got a new uh, photography editor and you're going to have a shot for them before he wanted him specifically for this. Um, and so how do we go from sort of these perfect images in the 60s and 50s to sort of these democratized images that we can make and set for, and this is where we where we landed now. So I guess um, as I go along, I'm thinking about the photographic ontology, like the nature of photography as its own being, what its function is, uh, what its visceral purpose is in our modern timeline, the downstream effects. Um, our zeitgeist now and before, and I'm not gonna answer these questions at all, I'm just gonna talk, but I'm sure you guys can think about it. you're smart people, and you know, just kind of think, uh, think a little bit more critically, because I'm, I'm a, definitely a harsh critic of photography, and uh, I'm kind of looking at you guys for that, but. All right, the Holy Trinity. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with this, maybe you're not. Uh, we'll start with Barnes at the bottom left corner. Uh, he wrote a, famously wrote, I mean he wrote many, many novels, 
and critique my pieces, but he's, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Cam and Pesita, which he wrote, I believe, in 1978, directly after his mother passed, and about two, it was the last book he wrote as well, actually, and he passed about a year or two after, after right, completing. But what's interesting is he thought about photography as that has been. So you snap an image, and it, that is, and you look at it, and that was a moment that did exist, but now it's gone. So it's the continual dying and morbidity of image making. And I bring up his mother dying and him dying because clearly he was in a morbid stage of his own life, so that I'm sure influenced his work and why he was receiving image making like that. But I think that's that is generally how we perceive image images as well in this day and age. We if I take an image of the audience right now and look at it later tonight, I'm going to associate certain emotions and feelings on how I felt while speaking to you, and that was an image that's bygone, and I can look back on that with some sort of galvanized nostalgia. So, um, and Krauss on the right side, which I really want to talk about because she had sort of the same idea as him um, in a little bit different way. But uh, then we have Baudrillard, the simulacrum, simulacrum uh, which is the postmodern thought. He sort of deviated from the Marxist idea, which is um, humans are built off of commodity and our uh, physical reality within the like, commodity based off of our physical reality. And he thought that no, that's not what reality is derived from. Our modern reality only functions on the basis of symbols, the idea of money, status, wealth, ineffable, ethical. Um, so, and I think that sort of more aligns with the European images and some modern. Um, idea of making images versus the past. Death. Uh, this is just driving home the, the Barthes point. Every image is a true sacrifice of the moment. Time being fleeting, time being the um, most important asset to him. Uh, this was almost like a sacrifice. Each moment was a sacrifice, and to remember that sacrifice of the moment was something very special and nearly spiritual to him. I think the photographer that um, best embodies this is Masahiso Kukase, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you're not, he, he's sort of every photographer's favorite photographer, at least at some point in their life. Yeah, I mean, his most famous book being The Solitude of the Raven, the reissue of just the Raven, you know, very expensive photo book, but um, brilliant. But fit, and he, live within the space of morbidity and death, just as Barthes was explaining. So what I mean by that is he was in love with a woman, married her for 15, like for 15 years, um, and he was obsessed with her. She was her, she was the muse, the moment, everything to him, and he um, created multiple projects around her, but he ended up divorcing him after 15 years, and he made sort of his, I, I guess it is his penultimate work, because he did make one work after The Raven, but he, he was divorced, she divorced him, he went into exile, and he found solace in the Raven, photographed Ravens for a year or two, and came up with what is probably the most legendary book, but obviously he's recounting the death of his marriage, the death of those feelings, the identity of himself in a new landscape, um, you know, transposed onto these, these beings that have nothing to do with the anthropogenic idea of what the normal view you point this camera at, which is her all the time, I went from anthropogenic to the natural world, the natural world being the raven. So, um, yeah, from muse and family and community and these, these, these ideas of you know, documenting our family so we can remember them in a certain moment to the bleakness of the raven and He's much more in Dido's lane, as you can see, very sort of abstract, almost impressionist viewpoint. High levels of grain, carelessness with shutter speed, and sort of these technical aberrations that happen that we try to, like, like the modern photographer tries to avoid. But there's obviously like a, another level of emotion that comes from that one. You know, sort of, you can like feel this carelessness and, and searching through the frame and through the lens. My favorite photo of his wife, I believe, like midway through the marriage. I'm sure if any of you are on Tumblr, you've seen this. <laughs> but 
very, very tough. This is what everybody wants to look like when they when they go to the Hamptons or they are in Malibu to put photos on the ticket like their their girlfriends or whatnot, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, all right, I took this photo. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 but it, it reminds me of the same, this is uh, sort of really odd, I took this in 2017 or so, and I, I sort of just became, I was very depressed, I mean, I, I always am, but it was on a sort of different level when I was younger, and I was very alone uh, in Colorado, so really no one around me, so I, and I didn't have anyone to photograph with really, and my father really likes to photograph mountains and sunsets, so in an effort to probably, you know, move away from him doing that, and you know, sort of work out my own world as uh, Picasso has done with the Raven. I sort of became obsessed with these horses and wild horses in the Southwest, some, some wild, some tame, everything in between. This is a group for a pack of wild horses that pretty much stayed within 30 minutes of my house that I would visit nightly. And they would always run away from me. And I, 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 remember I wanted to shoot film, and I would never shoot film now, this was early on. And 35 millimeter camera, trying to autofocus in the middle of the night with a snowstorm and you're running in you know, a couple feet of snow and they're running. I, after probably shooting for two years, I really only have maybe like 20 usable images just because of the nature of like, the, the technology I was using. But I'm using film, 35 millimeter. I'm shooting horses in the Southwest. This is clearly a, a barking point of view, the death of something. This is more than just the death of an image of my memory of these horses. This is like the death of the Southwest. This is the death of the idea of the cowboy. This is the, you know, the, the democratization of this like, this like Silicon Valley, like pet new wave, like that's sweeping over America. This is sort of the, the death of that. So it, it reminded me of this. Plus like the, the, the way I was shooting this is very, very similar to, I mean, I actually don't have the image, but he did take an image of snow sort of streaking with no ravens, and it, but it has a similar similar affect, I think. More from that era. Um, there, it, it's odd that these creatures could become more special to you than you were special to yourself or your family or something. You really can transpose and then transgress your emotions when you sort of make an animal about yourself, which I don't think is very healthy, but I think it's just, sometimes you gotta just shove it through. But yeah, I lost the negative to that one, so that's never never gonna be able to reuse, unfortunately. <coughs> and it was in the same vein, uh, when I moved to LA, and a little bit before I was shooting rodeos, and at the same time, I can't fucking find this image anywhere, so I took it from Instagram, so it's like cock square, but it was much wider, usually. Um, but it's that same idea of like, the death of something, the remembrance of something, you know, like these, these cowboys are still doing what they need to do and, you know, performing in the rodeo space, but it means a far different thing than it used to, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. So you can just feel when something is at its end and this is what the end looks like for them. Even though this will go on, I'm sure, for X amount of years, but it will go on in a, a far, far different way. Um, this is, uh, I came across this photo of me and my father, uh, I think maybe, maybe six years old, no, I think maybe seven years old at the time, and we were building our family's home. Because uh, there's something I'll bring up later in the lecture, this dirt pile, obviously many artists use dirt as sort of a motif, and I was obsessed with dirt too, and I'm wondering like, why am I so obsessed with dirt mounds and piles, and am I just sort of copying the trickle down effect from sort of these really fine artists. But then I saw this image and I realized in the background that dirt pile was everything to me. I remember sleeping in it, almost living in it half the time because I was too young to really be helping. Like I've helped as much as possible, but that dirt pile was sort of my home. And yeah, this, 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 this image reminded me of like, this, this more, this more that I that I keep sort of harping on. Also, that's really what I wanted to say about this. Going back to uh, the lecture this morning, how that stage was the right stage for the professor to be talking about his thoughts and his, his, his dialect and his speech. This, this house was probably like 2,000 square feet. Not super large, but it was, 
it was uh, rectangular, almost to the T. There was no like advanced architecture. We were, we were very poor back then, and we my father didn't think enough money to actually like, raise the structure to have like build walls, trusses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was just a stage, basically, about a seven foot stage in the middle of the countryside in Colorado for probably almost two, two and a half years. And we would always work on it. I remember putting tarps over it, and like, the rain would come, and you'd see the clouds roll off the mountains, and it's just sort of me and my father most of the time, and sometimes just me, sometimes my father and mother, but it was like literally a stage in the middle of the countryside for this sort of familial performance. And now looking back upon that, it, it's just interesting to think about it in those terms. Um, and I guess like everything is performative and has a stage in our life, but this is like a, a, an actual tangible stage. And I think that, I want, and I wonder why I remember these memories so vividly. I think that might be why, because it was the correct context for me to really remember what was happening then. And um, I thought that was sort of interesting. It wasn't sort of a non sequitur, but. Um, I, I promised I wasn't going to mix in, I promised I wasn't going to mix in like anything that wasn't just photography, but what I was talking about, it's very, I think, important. So many, uh, I mean, some of you guys may know that uh, you know, so there's a music, music project, but there's a lot of crossover, like, image-wise, and the ideology of the image. And this is a, a good example of things I was just talking about. So basically, I made this video like, going back to my hometown and looking. My father pretty meticulously documented from like ninety, I think like ninety-one until two thousand something. And I refilmed all these sort of family videos and had to watch every single second of people's lives that I didn't know, people's lives that I did know, and like relive kind of their traumas, my, whatever it was. But of course, these are videos, and these aren't actual abstractions at the moment. These are VHS, highly nostalgic, you know, motion pictures. So I, my idea of them is definitely different from what they actually were, um, which is the, uh, the simulator that Bojo was talking about, that a photographic image is never what, it, what, what we think it is. It's just a recreation of the moment, and therefore, it's a new moment altogether. If I take, take a photo of you guys, it's a recreation that then lends itself to a completely different reality. Because when we look back upon this recreation of reality, we uh, expunge and reattach different thoughts, and therefore, have a completely different ideation from what the actual moment was. So I was experiencing sort of my family's history in a different way than they actually experienced it and trying to reinterpolate it with a score, which is a song we made, but we're not going to the song with it uh, because I think it, it kind of defeats the point. Um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to walk on this on that one. myself doing it as a child, like the self-portrait idea, and later in the video you'll see we sort of refilmed my parents at later stages in their life and added new footage from modern day, sort of create like this alternate narrative. to utilize 
most viral ever. Well, we'll believe it not. Management consultants. There are three big firms. And you know. It's a good thing to pause on that. This is going, I forgot to mention, the, the marketing point of view really lends itself, I think, the best to the artists, the people who want to be artists, because it sort of implies that you, I really like this part, it's a self-portrait of, you know, me in the womb of my son. But um, it sort of implies that you need a muse of some sort, in this case it's my parents. And sort of myself, I guess, and like the time that we spent together that I can't quite remember or make sense of. But for example, the muse of Picasso's um, wife, and the muse uh, transcends something that uh, Barton called studium and punctum, studium being sort of like the mechanical qualities of an image, and punctum being that inevitable quality, the thing you can't quite put your finger on that uh, sort of makes you stay and emotionally moves you. And, the, the muse, I think, he never said this, but I think what it does is, instead of the, the moment of the image dying with the image that you took, the, the muse can transcend time and image to image so that the, 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 the narrative continues. I think that's very, very important for a postmodern sort of plot. So augmented with, you know, casted actors, sort of recreating secondary narratives, like merging the timelines. Establishing the end of former characters and the proliferation of them, the, the additional, the additional characters. And picking up the self. -portion. 
Unfortunate. also the point where I would visit home and I would realize that, you know, I would hear, I realized my parents, my parents uh, morbidity and their nearness to death and sort of the slipping of their minds and I guess it was, that was a way to sort of counteract, counterbalance that. Um, Terms like hyper average, mysterious mundane, domestic spaces, universal environments, all these postmodern, uh, simulacratic terms come into play. So I love using sort of landscapes, parking lots, you know, expansive urban landscapes, just because um, Jonathan Anderson, the director of the way they, the creative director of the way they, said something really interesting I heard you recently, where he mentioned that um, what is it, domestic spaces. Uh, abide by logic of their own reason, which is very interesting. So we have two different subjects here. We have the landscape and we have Nicholas Cage. Most of us know much about Nicholas Cage, and most of us know much about a parking structure, a parking lot, and we also know a lot about Las Vegas. So we have all these interconnected narratives sort of speaking to one another, uh, photographically shot in a very mundane, stripped back, no you know, exacerbated lighting, just sort of is what it is. Anybody could take the image. Uh, and opposing them in a certain way that you know, sort of makes him vulnerable to anyone's gaze, uh, and so that he, he seems more, more penetrable, I guess. Uh, and this brings up a good point with creating contrast, contrast in your subject. And you know, everything is, everything is referential, like the three towers in the background sing, sing, uh, signify me and them and the image. These eggs are a reference to uh, 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 one of my favorite artists who I won't name just because you know, there has to be some sort of mystery, I guess. But no one's, no one's mentioned it before, um, so I'm getting away with it. Um, sort of images in a similar vein. Strip down, mundane images that are the, the landscape is speaking for the image on its own terms. Not even the images that I necessarily enjoy, I just think that these images are sort of important for the, the zeitgeist of now, because 
when you meant people to sort of copy the style, and you probably see this all over Instagram now. Um, this was uh, another sort of reinterpolation of going back to Colorado. So there's like an SSX video, which is all Colorado based, and we have this editorial I did um, with one of my friends, and we went back to Colorado, went to these different locations in my town that like, meant something to me to some degree, like this location, I have the image. Like that first image or on the ground with the rocks, that's not the exact same location as my father there 35, 40 years earlier. And it really hasn't changed much. So so like trying to re-understand or close the, the final chapter is like my time within that space. And like for example, the gun that she's holding, a 308 lever action, it's like the, the gun when we were when I was very young and my father killed elk with and I had killed animals with that as well as we would eat, and it was the only thing we would eat that winter, but like, that was the tool that allowed us to feel life for ourselves. So, you know, reimagining yeah. that through a fashion lens, I thought was very interesting. Well, she's wearing all these painter jeans that she painted, painted homes in, and it's, you know, just sort of like mixing these contexts, and although the, the viewer may not understand um, if it means something to me, it's probably going to come through in the lens, which I think is important. You know, I'm my dad's hunting grass, and the town hall you know, she's, you know, praying with my parents and my mother's wedding dress. Um, I, some of my father's photographs on the wall, like inside the bedroom that I stayed in the basement. I was sort of running into two because my father thought I was always sick and I was going to get him sick. So. And there's an image I didn't include, but talking about recounting my past. Um, this is like the first, the first record that I made was in this college classroom. And I made an image I didn't include with the model earlier. Her, she was you know, posing in front of this wall but in a different way. So, you know, sort of trying to draw these very important, poignant, contextual meanings that will enhance the image for myself that will come through to, to the viewer. I'm um, talking about context and distance. This is uh, Michael, Michael has a double negative. He just dug trenches into the Moapa Valley, and it, it, it's, proven, it's proven that there is contrast in a space that you normally wouldn't understand. So we, we, we think of something like the mysterious mundane in a fashion, which would be like Cindy Kimberly and the most recent campaign, walking in like a, I it's like an IMG campaign day, but she is walking into a courtroom, but she's wearing sort of like stripper clothing, basically. That's like a gross exaggeration of metaphor, but uh, these sort of performance art and installation pieces are signifiers of that. This is Ernest Fisher, you, quote unquote, and same idea, but sort of a paradoxical approach, digging a trench within a gallery context. And also a very similar narrative, which would be like Dash Snow's Nest, uh, famous installation uh, in the early 2000s that it's, uh, Deutsch in New York, I believe, or maybe Hauser, I can't remember, but it's saying the exact same thing, but with a different applied material that is more closely related to his line of work. So the dirt to me is trash to him. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to show maybe sort of like what more recently some of, some of my work has been looking like. This isn't even a final approach, per se, but it's, um, it's nearly there. Um, this is an editorial from Uber Over Land that shot me a month or two ago, and wanted to democratize and make the office and sort of the downtown structure of any metropolis type city unrecognizable until the last frame. And I'm obsessed with nothing happening lately. Like this, just nothing is going on. It's just two figures passing, this guy passing this newer model, and nothing is going down, but for some reason it draws you closer to the character. Like with the Nicholas Cage images, you're able to, using sort of this mundane background, you are able to scrutinize the integrity of the object inside the frame at a higher level. And when you photograph something, that inherently everything in the frame becomes an object, whether you want it to be or not. It's no longer a person. It's uh, it's a quantifiable object. So, and especially in fashion, largely because he's wearing clothing from a, a brand. It's a brand special. 
uh, which I would have said earlier, otherwise I wouldn't have addressed it like this. But um, yeah, when nothing happens, you almost look at it more intently, depending on who you are, but and it will, it will sort of tell you more rather than um, it trying to beat you over the head with some sort of lightning trick or whatnot. You know, the absence of character. And I really, I really love the money, the money images. There's another one later, but you know, the, the idea of a businessman who you only like a Rolex or AP or some sort of some sort of watch, but instead just replacing that with the monetary value and using the numerical value of the, the bills as like a passage of time, um, which we see. which we see later with Bill, that it's all on the ground. And the final image, uh, the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Twin Towers on the New York skyline in Manhattan, sort of contextualizing where this story could have taken place. If you're not really sure, even most of it was shot in downtown LA, but the last shot, um, it recreated the Twin Towers on the skyline. And it's sort of like a combination of a Barthian approach and a Baudrillian idea, um, like a postmodern, and it's like the death of that has been image. Um, that brings me to, I think I mentioned I have a solo gallery in LA. Um, this past summer, and so basically what I've been doing is placing motion sensor trail cameras all around Los Angeles, strapped to poles for uh, many, like for three or four years, and out of probably 1.1 million images, I chose 15 or so, actually it was more like 20, 25, but I chose them and framed them uh, and showed these images and tried to drive them to the point that these images are more, they're not photographs because the camera itself has no aesthetic autonomy. If something passes by, it must take or gather an image. Therefore, every moment is of equal importance, which is sort of what I am getting at when I say I love when nothing happens. If nothing happens with an image, it's more important to me than if something is happening. So, um, and I would never use black and white as an aesthetic choice, I, but the camera's using infrared technology, so it's a, a technical aberration, which probably, I guess, that's where I draw the line. These were framed in handport resin frames, which I was a little bit afraid that it's sort of a big truck, small dick situation, trying to make the images seem more important than they are, but I wanted to drive home the objective quality that these are, in fact, objects um, that go beyond the frame of just a photographic realm, because I did not snap the shutter. Project is really interesting because sometimes you just get ridiculous aberrations like this that you would never foresee. Like, why did this image take place like this? It, it just it looks otherworldly and yeah, the mysterious mundane. This uh, particular set was set in front of a Whole Foods, um, a whole Whole Foods like outside bench and. I really like this image because it's, it reminds me of like the Protestant Reformation where they started painting um, the plates of cheese and grapes and fruit on, it, on the table as religious imagery. And that's what this reminds me of. Like, instead of people eating at Whole Foods, you just have the singular Whole Foods basket. And the child using Whole Foods box is like a sculptural apparatus in rejection of his family. And someone just putting their finger over the lens, creating this red blur, which happened, happened multiple times. So there's infinite stories within the project, like this before and after, before and after, before and after. Similar to like having a funny image on the wrist that I, I showed earlier. More, more about photography. Um, actually. Before we move off of Ogre Yard and sort of the simulate from 
watch one more video. Um, and this is sort of like, in my mind, like the fusion of postmodern image thought and pre postmodern that we've been touching on. Thinking about like the mysterious mundane aesthetics, thinking of the that has been ideas of Barth, and just the idea of sort of like a, a dream girl in a specific landscape in America. And, and how that obsession might unravel and evolve. In these linear mundane spaces. Always keeping note of the proletariat, the working class, <laughs> the gathering of goods, of uh, dirt, or some sort of other object, and the transposing of that, and the, the extraction of something precious inside of it. Sort of being how we can make this sleek and sexy and make this like make this gold panning and this whole narrative feel as sleek as a dream girl should and how much how much she should feel within a frame.
Basically, uh, there was some French sociologists who had thought about when the camera was fully democratized in the, the, the 40s and it started becoming more and more popular. People used to stand at these end of these obelisks and they would just stare and watch, but they, over time, started taking photographs of them and then capturing themselves within these photographs. And it's a great, a great, uh, a great passage. I'm a great sociologist that I think is worth reading, which is uh, as early as 1956, Gunther Anders criticized photography as a technical surrogate for direct experience in his essay, I Can Nami. Anyone who has had the opportunity to observe tourists, namely people from highly industrialized countries on the move in Rome or Florence, will have noted how greatly it confuses them to encounter singularities. Those imposing historical relics standing about as unique specimens of the serial world. The argument that such people compensate for their insecurity in dealing with uniqueness through excessive use of their cameras, since they no longer know any existence except one among effigies, the serial produced wares of their world between, with, and from which they live. Reproductions, copies from patterns, replicas are simply their reality, which is. Um, yeah, I think it's clear. Um, I'll read that last part. The serial produced squares of their world between with which they live. Reproductions, copies from patterns, simulacrum, replicas, simulacrum, are simply their reality. So we're basically living our entire lives now off of photographic uh, reality that is in fact not reality at all. Um, Bosden, an, an art critic and film critic um, from many years ago, has suggested that photography has freed Western painting from an imperative for realism and enabled it to work with aesthetic autonomy, which is why I think that we see painting being exalted as a uh, contemporary higher art form than photography, because photography is burdened the task of recreating and rendering reality as opposed to painting, which is free from aesthetic autonomy of trying to recreate the modern world. And that's really, that's really sort of what I want to, it's just what I wanted, wanted to like wrap this up, but just thinking about the idea that photographs that we're taking are not real, they are a mix of death of the moment, they are a mix of simulacrum, and they should be taken less seriously than the intent that we thrust upon them. And um, since photography is probably the best way of communicating, images are the way that we communicate according to poetry and art in this modern era, I think it's imperative that we take them less seriously than we do now because the, the things that images and photographs are communicating to us simply are not the things that we are abstracting and acquiring from the reading of these images. And there's much less communication in the photographic and image world that is seriously, I think, damaging our current reality and the tangible identity of our reality. But um, if anybody has any questions or anybody wants to talk about uh, like Palestine or <laughs> anything that may be more important to them, that would be the time. Could you say the name of that essay again? Uh, the last one? Yeah, the quote about images being. Uh, yeah, it's um, I Konami, um, Gunther Anders, which I can, I can write it down for you. I Konami is uh, A-K-O-N-O-M-A-N-I-E. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. When you were talking about the trail cam photos, and you said you'd never do black and white, why is that? Um, 
because I think it's the I think it's the photo's duty to try. You know, I, I'm sort of flip off on this because I think on one hand it's the photo, uh, the photograph's identity and it's its purpose to mimic reality or try and get as close to reality as possible without taking an aesthetic liberty, which is black and white. Sort of like making black and white we perceive as like old technology, and okay, it's just nostalgia baiting, and I hate when things are nostalgia baiting. Hate film photography. Hate film movies that are shot modern film. symbols that mean something else to us. Um, they've been delegitimized because of the photographic prowess, but photographs are far less potent and poignant in what they're saying to us as opposed to like the identity of a character of a U or a W or an X. So um, I don't think that black and white is useful in the modern era at all. And I would highly recommend that nobody ever shoot black and white. <laughs> Yes. So the first regards um, Barnes and Cameron Sita, right? So he came, he, he passed before the digital era, and Cameron Sita, the argument of, of uh, an image of sacrifice in the moment is because there, it's a physical representation of image. Like, you know, the film is, is literally ingrained by the photons of the moment. Like the, the chemical miracle. The chemical miracle. And so I was wondering, I guess my, I, this maybe is, is a bigger question, but it's, what do you see happening when you turn to digital? Do you find bars still applicable? How does it change over time? I think that bars is only applicable in the digital era by, sort of what I mentioned earlier, it's that it's, you, he pulls sort of along with this romanticization of artistry, and the muse, I think, has been proliferated by the idea of his works and this nostalgic barrier that pertains to his idea of an image as opposed to someone like Baudrillard where, I mean Baudrillard was a pretty prolific photographer as well. Like he never took, even with film, he never took images, because I think he died before the advent of digital as well. It, it actually most definitely did. But he never took images of people. It was always landscapes because he didn't think that, he thought that placing a, a subject or a character within the frame would you know, muddy up the identity too much. And, you know, so I think that a healthy mix between a Barthelian approach to sort of revel and relish in this idea of being an artist and you know like the chemical miracle I just said that identity mixed with like the postmodern aestheticism to be cutting edge on the ever-changing uh, zeitgeist of symbols and symbology that we deal with on day to day like whether it be what the fucking e-girl looks like yesterday versus today or you know, it's like trying to catch a, a fish in the stream with your hand, you know, it's constantly slipping as soon as you grab it and trying to slap the fly. So I think you have to have a two-toned approach to, you know, looking at the old, acknowledging the old, applying the new. I guess that answers what your question is. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because also in digital, there's Marketing. I think that photography is great as a 
place the best tool for marketing, like fashion photography. Sure, you use your film camera and like recreate something from the 90s or 80s or some Steven Myself photo, whatever you want, but I think it's great for marketing, but it's not great for like, photography as a fine art approach. But I don't really think photography has a place in the fine art world either. I think that a fine artist can utilize photography in the fine art world. I don't think that photographs inherently uh, elicit like fine art nature. Um, but I do think they're perfect for marketing. And I think that that's why they still, like, even if you don't know it, it's sort of this inevitable feeling that photographs are not as good as paintings. And like one of the reasons why I mentioned that I knew being like, uh, paintings that are free of aesthetic autonomy because photographs took over the portrait, you know, and like the hyper real, you know, trying to get dot for dot what reality looks like. So I think mean, painting now more than ever lends itself to being a fine art motif and motive as opposed to photography, which is sort of just this like corporate drone of marketing, like, you know, you know. No, you're, you're, I think you're very right, but I think it's more so we understand how performative, especially Instagram is, like every image is face tune, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's hyper, hyper, hyper performative, whereas opposed to nothing happening, a non edited, nothing photo is the emphasis of that. So it feels like a reprieve, and I feel like there's a, a satiating quality to that. And yeah, it just, and I, like, the, the, I feel like the time to be beautiful in the sense of like a mycelium type of lighting, you know, like a, a chiaroscara or a, uh, a Caravaggio type of lighting in a, in a photographic realm. I think it's, it's far gone. It's only for marketing purposes now, like to create drama. We're living drama. Like, you know what I mean? We don't need more and that's not going to necessarily sell something. What's going to sell something is like, and plus in this like post war in era of the celebrity, which is like somebody is dying, of course, like it doesn't mean what it used to mean, which is why I think those Jurgen images are so brilliant because it just shows how, like, sort of like, it shows their gestures of privilege in real time and how kind of stupid everything is, while also you're able to scrutinize them at a higher level, which may be good for them, or maybe bad for their career, whatever it might be, but it just allows an entire different layer as opposed to, you know, seeing people chop beautifully in the studio, like, we get it. Celebrities are perfect, uh, but I like why not see them in this new sense and like this landscape that we've all been a part of or we're familiar with. And it goes back to the Michael Pfizer um, installation um, with the, the at the Malaco Valley with the dirt dug out into the trenches, which is you're going to be saying that landscape is barred in detail because of these man made trenches as opposed to entanglement there. And the same thing with the Earth's Fisher U dirt installation being a paradoxical point of that, but it's in a gallery, so you're looking at a gallery in a different way, and the space in the city, you know, it's, a, it's, it's that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I think that nothing is the reprieve of the moment, whereas years ago, the drama was the reprieve from the nothingness. You know, because we live so long with like the mundane aspects of like the post industrial age, you know, like like factories and wars, like these like sort of things that um, were happening at a fervent rate, but we reached the peak and I like, sort of I guess when we reached the peak culturally in America, we we declined in a way and we kind of need to like rip the covers off and like it's the morning after and no one's wearing makeup anymore and we need to see what the fuck we're doing in a real visceral sense, I guess.
not very, not very interesting to me. That's true. Um, it's really easy in the beginning because you see photographers like um, uh, too many names for the artist. Uh, for legendary photographer, but he would I'm sure he's gonna make some of his images, but there's an iconic one actually in the Woodford Park in San Francisco. It's like the one the iconic one, whatever it is, you know, the, the park, the Golden Gate Park, and he photographs a couple lying down and a shadow is kind of sort of cast over them. And like that's an easy thing to do, and you know we're all all like kind of like in the dark, we're all like kind of like I'm gonna put my stuff in the frame. And you can see it now; it's tasteless bullshit. And I'm not pointing anybody out or any names, but you still see like you still see people putting themselves in the frame tastelessly. And it's like at what cost? Like why do you need to be in there? I get it. Maybe it's for your brand. It's just marketing your own brand. It's completely abstracting any merit the image may or may not have for. The gain of selling, you know. Um, but in terms of a good question, for the trail camera, I position myself like I was trying to like, like trying to trap a fever or something. But putting these cameras in specific areas where something may have happened, like either I'd seen something earlier, or like you know, sort of calculating where a moment might take place at a certain time within these hours. Um, and so like that, that's completely different because those aren't photographs, even though like, they are but they're not, it's, it's, it's diluted. But in terms of photograph photographs, like fashion work, fashion work is different from just shooting, I guess, in general, like a landscape or just like walking around the street. But I think fashion, I want to be the model. I don't want to be like, like a separate from the model, basically, and trying to sort of mirror them, I guess. Um, or I'd rather I'm trying to have them mirror me, rather, because I don't really trust what, they're, like, they're here to bring what I want to the table, I guess, more or less. Um, or as opposed to when you're shooting in the street or something. I used to be aggressive, and I wanted to, like, attack the subject constantly, but um, and now it's sort of, now it's sort of fallen backwards into just capturing broad swatches of moments and, like, seeing what that says. So I'm not really answering your question very well because I honestly don't really know where I'm where I'm positioning myself. I just sort of feel it and it happens. I hate to be the guy who does a Rick Rubin quote right now, but <laughs> it's like, what does he say? It's something about, uh, something about, um, you know, sometimes the artist doesn't even know what the artist is doing, whatever, some stupid, you know, cliche, but that kind of is. Not that I think I'm really an artist, I think I, I think I, understand artistry, um, but artistry is probably something more sort of captured in a bottle of lightning or you know a different sort of metaphor, but I don't know, it's, it's, so I don't know, I kind of just rambled, but I didn't answer your question, so I apologize. No, no worries, I mean, you definitely did give insights, and even not knowing the artistry stuff, thank you. Um, so I have a It's, I, I think it's because, um, if you think about motion picture and that sort of motion picture these, I think capturing your family is very photographic, even if it's a video or just a still, or as opposed to like a cinematic motion picture. So I, I can kind of call it VHS, like moving pictures or moving like photographs. But those were, in my mind, simulate room. And therefore the narrative that I was watching on the screen wasn't the actual there that these people existed within. So I felt that it was sort of my duty and I was allowed to extend and create a further narrative based off of the life I was currently living in Los Angeles, which is why I like to introduce the self-portrait of myself, like, you know, looking up at these familial figures because it was sort of all just my narrative, you know? It's just how I was interpreting my family's past and what I thought they were doing. So 
I thought that if I just left it at that, one would be too boring because who gives a fuck about my family, you know, and two, there's more to the story than just that. Because if I left it at that, it would seem like I'm just taking the clips back verbatim, but they're not verbatim, they're something else completely and entirely. And with the, the score as well, it becomes something else. But for this, I just wanted it to be about the picture, but with the, with the score, it's an, an, an entire different world, I guess. But. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you guys use the Well, I think that people, I mean, people do care about aesthetics, but then it depends on if they know what aesthetics are. You know, aesthetics of somebody might be like MAC makeup all red on their face or something, but it looks like, you know, it's not correct. But so there's like taste is hard and hard to find. So I guess sharpening your perception of, you know, good taste, which does exist. Good taste does exist. I don't think what you're telling me, um, But um, I've always been hyper vigilant and hyper aware of myself in a room. It's honestly like some of the, the, like, the least aware I've been in a room almost. I remember growing up, like I would feel people watching me and children looking at me and I was completely frozen. So I've always been very aware of how I was looking in a room or reality. So almost, I mean, almost LA was a, a good fit because it already embodied those mechanisms and those ideas, I guess, for better or for worse, you know. Um, and I'm still more aware than most, you know, of what's going on. So, yeah, I'm very surprised I didn't say the spectacle once, the whole thing. You did, I was paying attention. I did, did yeah. I say it? Oh, no, you didn't. I did, yeah. yeah. I, could, I should have actually said it, but I'm leading <laughs> to it. Um, yeah, it's all the spectacle, it's the hyper reality, it's the, the, the performance, the non stop performance, and we're paying for it with things that we don't even understand, I guess. But, Why would you say you understand artistry that you're not an artist? Um, I just take it very seriously, and I think that it's something that you dedicate yourself to thoroughly in your entire identity, which I sort of have, but just because you want to be a professional baseball player and you dedicate every second of every hour, every day, of every year to practicing and being a better player doesn't mean you're in the MLB. And uh, I feel like that's maybe sort of the state I'm in mean, now, and I feel like it's going to take a lifetime to truly you know, unravel the idea of art in the modern sphere. And just because you have a Kagosian exhibit or whatever, whatnot, doesn't mean you're a real artist. It just means that you are, you've um, created the product that you thought. And like, you can argue that that is art now, but you know, I, I'd rather it be something different and something that's more narrative based as opposed to just you know, a monetary incentive or value. There's obviously the tribes in the market now, which is fine. Like, that's cool. Like, we like Warhol and you know, nice. But, there's obviously it's something much deeper sociologically, anthropologically, ideologically that is to be unraveled and understood, especially in this modern time. Right? Like the world is so crazy. Like usually it takes, you know, used to take hundreds of years for things to change, but they change what what took a hundred years to change five hundred years ago takes two days to change now. So it's very interesting and I think something brilliant will come over like the next twenty to fifty years artistically. And Trying to be a part of it, trying to dig dirt out of the hole. No more dirt in the hole, you know, just dig it out and like, try and move the barometer via any vehicle possible, I guess. Best video I've ever seen in a decade, no doubt. And it's from last year, and he, uh, he's, in, he's in Congress, and sort of like the 
C-span intervals, and it assumes then 2G and the X president who's sitting in the sitting car. Yes, you know, and he gets ousted, and all of a sudden he gets taken away. It's so, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I highly recommend it, any of you watch it. That moment, and then the zoom out, and you see the entire congressional court with the sickle and the hammer, like the sickle and the hammer. It's one of those beautiful things, eerie, hopeful. It's, uh, it's brilliant. And I watch it, I watch it probably three or four times a night, and I put different songs over. I like putting like the John Frusciante song over the point where the ex president touches the shoulder of G, like trying to get him to allow him to stay, and like triggering like a John Frusciante song then because G lived in Iowa in like 1986 for a year with a family, and that's how he came up with the idea of merging Manifest Destiny with uh, the Red Party, you know, sort of mandate heaven, and wanted to make China westernize whilst they retaining the Red Party ideals, but he was obsessed with James Dean. He was on a corn farm. It's crazy. And so, like, this twang, drunk for Chante, like, hazy, drugged out guitar over that moment, offering, like, whatever hopeful, equilibrium, and also, like, horror. I would, I watch, I, I, yeah, I watch all the time. That's what I'm obsessed with. It's a, we used to the stage. We used to the stage visuals for part part of the performance we did in Las Vegas. Where there were four giant screens that were like wall sized, and the, the sound sucked, but the visual was you know this G walking, and then there's horses all after like running out, and like this sort of exit procession, I guess. So I don't know. Obsessed with China. It's very interesting, and um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. 